Hey guys, so today I want to talk about existential angst. And I know I've touched this briefly in several of my other episodes, but I want to do this one specifically from the point of view of existential existential angst. So what is it in a nutshell? Existential angst is this kind of underlying angst, anxiety that we sense subconsciously by the knowledge of how minute we are in the face of space and time. So I'm going to start with... The baby in the womb. The baby in the womb, uh, you know, they're just kind of having a sensory experience. They don't even know what they're a part of. They're hearing sounds, they're seeing colors, but they don't really know it. They're not even doing that at first. They're just consciousness growing in cells into a body. And eventually they have eyes, ears, apparatus to sense and, 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 and see things. But they don't really know that's what's happening either. If you think about it, it's, it's a dream that's kind of unfolding. It's a dream that's gaining complexity as it goes along. It's kind of like the difference between closing your eyes and opening them slowly and things taking shape. And for nine months, this vessel of consciousness is, you know, that's what, that's what it's doing. That's what it's, it's, it's doing that. It's growing. It's growing into being a human being. The human being, the version of the human. And then at some point, it comes out of the womb. And some point after that, it, it, it realizes what it is. So at first, a baby is, is, is highly narcissistic in order just to survive existential angst. It, it can't be aware of it yet, or else it would just crawl up and, and 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 like crawl up on it in, a, in on itself it would just uh, shit itself and not be able to move and just be stuck you know it, it just would uh, life would seem way too big way too big for that baby so it believes that the world is an extension of itself it, it cries and mom and dad come and feed it you know if it's a, if it's a baby that's well cared for Mom and dad come and try and figure out what it's trying to say by crying. And the baby can mostly only cry and make sounds. So it'll cry just to figure out what worth it is to cry sometimes. That's why babies cry and they don't even want anything sometimes. They just, they just, they just don't know what they're experiencing. So they're, they're crying. They don't like it. They, they want it to change. In the womb, nothing was solidified, you know. And um, so the baby has to believe that the, the world's an extension of itself. Because the, the, it, it just was being for nine months and being kept changing and so outside of the womb it's like it's like a continuation of that you know if it's seeing different decor different days different temperatures different sensations uh parents in different moods uh, parents surprising with different things toys stories uh, sounds singing television dogs cats whatever it just seems like like a continuation of 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 the ride of the ride there's there's new aspects to it there's you know pain and stuff which kind of sucks but i doubt a baby even has an idea that it that it can be in danger that it can inextricably be caused harm you know so for then it's kind of void of existential angst because it just it just is. It doesn't know. It just is. Brain's taken in tons of stuff. And as a human, he gets interested in things. So those interests start to form cognitive patterns in the brain. Uh, memory. You know, it starts to notice there's rules to this thing. And then that's when the questioning begins. When it sees itself in the mirror and understands that it is separate from things. Because it can see its reflection just like it sees other people. And those things seem to be separate from it. Because when it gets hurt, they don't get hurt. Sometimes they don't show up or whatever else. So guys, it's, it's, the growth of consciousness is kind of just expanding out into this terrifying realization with, 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 with good parenting kind of easing you along the way. That's why good parents... They smother their baby with love. They feed it. They have all these hormones that 
make them feel like they're totally in love with the, the baby. And then even as a child, you tell that child, good job, good job for everything it does until like the age of 10. And of course, if we're not given that kind of, of, of love, encouragement and slow, like coaxing into realization that it is independent from the world around it. And well, you know, it's on good faith that it's, it's, it's all right that it's doing all right, that it's going to be all right, that it's going to survive, that it's going to be fine, that it's not going to be in too much, in too much pain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then as it, is encounters, as it encounters information, as that person encounters information that's just a bit much to process, then we form play. We form play around this. We form games around this. That's why people talk about playing out patterns. So let's say a baby's born and it doesn't get to be held by the mom right away because there's a complication. It goes into the incubator. <sighs> That's a harsh one. That's a harsh one for the baby. When it comes out and it's, it goes straight into an incubator or, or it's, it's just separate from its parents for a couple of hours, two, two to three days. This has happened to a friend of mine. Then there is a game around fighting things, for example, that starts from fighting to not be let go. Once it realizes after that amount of time what it feels like to be held, rather than being held right away and thinking that's the default, and then you go off into non-held states, always know that you can come back to being held. And then we play out these, these games, and these games kind of, they, they mold our personality and they allow us to go out into the world and become who we become. And there seems to be similarly formulaic things that we're trying to, exp that, that help cause expansion into an acceptance that we're just part of this thing that's so much bigger than us, that we'll never fully be able to grasp and compute, that we can contemplate for some reason and just be all right with it. And that's kind of our vibrations, is the agitation of that into space. That is our areas of tension. Tension that makes us need to create. And the most beautiful, beautiful thing about being human is, is, is even though that baby starts to realize at some point that the world's not an extension of itself, as these privileged species of human beings who can even experience existential angst, who can contemplate what we are, who can map out their environment, who can map out themselves, all in pursuit of answers of what are we, why are we here? The most existential questions that we can ask, hence the link to existential angst. What we start to find deeply, truly embedded in who we are is that we're designed to be able to depend on each other. We're designed to be healthy when we encourage each other to joy. We are designed to be healthy when we allow ourselves just to experience what we need to play out those games that caused us, that are linked to the trauma that was caused to us and find expansion. And that actually everything that we are is kind of pages in a book to unfold into a lifetime. And this is why it's amazing to be a healer. It's, it's amazing to have a spiritual practice. It's amazing to contemplate these things as well as psychology and science because, guys, it's all, it all connects. It all connects. It takes you in the same direction. I did a video recently on anxiety on my TikTok. Check me out, Healer Holly, on reframing anxiety and how anxiety can be a measure by which you're expanding. You can turn anxiety into a simulator. Friend of mine sent me an amazing meme recently. 
Valentina Kirikato. It said, anxiety is nothing but a conspiracy against yourself in your mind. And I'm, I'm here to debunk that conspiracy. Now I'm going to go a bit, I'm going to skip ahead. I'm going to go from existential angst to spiritual awakenings. Because I feel like spiritual awakenings are moments of reconciliation against existential angst that you don't need to be afraid of the future that you don't need to be afraid of what you don't know that, you, that especially in our day and age that we've we've earned that evolutively we we've, we've we've mastered the elements we have internal we have central heating we have refrigerators we have supermarkets we have the internet and slowly but surely as we start to cause a global climate change and, and and create that threat we're going to come up with the technology to live symbiotically with the planet and realize that our, our maximum potential for energy etc is is where we're heading it is our integration with our surroundings and we are at one of the best times to be human because we have the information to map that out and to start to foster that relationship and for it to become a societal norm way more deeply. And so for me, I'm going to, I'm going to use the example of, um, well, I had one, but uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to go into people who, who are a lot more popular than me. And then I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to elaborate this example of uh, spiritual awakening as being the antithesis to existential angst. And the uh, first person I want to talk about is Brene Brown because her book, Daring Greatly, and I, I suggest it to, I do, I do suggest it to anyone that I have long enough conversation with. It changed my life. So she is a vulnerability researcher. She's a social worker who wanted to find a formula around vulnerability being the answer to helping people she thought she could measure it she thought she could quantify it she thought she could put a lit, uh, tags on it and fit into a box and 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 find a formula that didn't allow her that allowed her to avoid getting her hands dirty and then what she learned after five years of compiling data and what she calls data is people's stories and and and, and looking for correlations is that vulnerability is the only way through And what I've learned in exercises of holding space and, and deeply listening and communing deeply with other people is that when you enter into any context with an openness to what happens, with a trust in your intuition, in what your body's telling you, your body, what you've landed in, what's already biologically linked to its environment deeply you start to realize that we are vessels for each other's healing that if you could like an actor who knew they were in a simulator just play through the lines improvised brilliance but not improvised because you we have a deep intuition that if we're not judging ourselves we act out so it is like a script that we can accept or not And all the mishaps are just dramatic tension. All the failures to do so are dramatic tension. They're detours in our journeys towards healing to lead us back to that journey towards healing more expanded through what we've gone by, by virtue of what we've gone through to come back to that route. And when I say more expanded, I mean with a bigger net of other people's doubts, like experiences that help consolidate other people's doubts to wrangle them in. To realize that we can trust who we are. So coming back to Brene Brown. After five years of trying to, to, to beat down vulnerability. She ended up having what she called a mental breakdown. And what her therapist that she had to go and seek out. Called a spiritual awakening. Because and this is. This is, uh, this is because of how my awakening felt. 
it seems she found information that was so unavoidably seemingly the case. that she realized to be her smartest self, she had to live fully. She had to let herself feel everything she could be programmed to feel in order to help others gravely and to progress her career, give herself a sense of purpose, put herself on a journey that is fulfilling. And that's all our truth is ever trying to step us into. Whatever that might be for, for any of us. The other person I think of with the spiritual awakening is um, Eckhart Tolle. So in his uh, book, The Power of Now, he starts it by telling you he was in a grave depression and he was going to let go of everything. And he wanted to kill himself. And the phrase that, uh, that kept recurring in his head is, I can't stand... I can no longer stand being with myself. I can no longer stand being myself. Until he, in all the focus on that pain and nothing else, and the pain occurring in that thought, realized he was being, he's directing himself to seeing an obvious question within that phrase. Which one am I? The I that cannot bear being myself or the self that cannot be being bared by the I? And then he felt super light. Well, I mean, he says that he, he, he felt growing energy into a voice that told him to let go. Like he just like he was a turtle that just realized its own shell and could let that go because he was carrying it unnecessarily could be swimming free without it and so I've been recently doing episodes on anxiety and uh, as I said reframing anxiety and realizing that when when you when you see it as an energy to sit with. And to keep working through towards that thing that you know you, you feel elated doing. That you open up pathways in the brain. Or even if it's not something that you feel elated doing, but something you think you should be interested in. Like, in, like, like reading a book. Reading books, reading books. Uh, doing meditation, whatever it is. going to the gym, starting a new hobby. As long as you focus on being allowed to experience it, you move through it. And you're opening up pathways in the brain. And so that's on the microcosmic scale. On the macrocosmic scale, that takes you back to, to being. That takes you back to allowing yourself to be in the motions, in the current of what's happening. So hence, not needing to understand your size and place in the universe. Just actually accepting it. And supposedly that comes with a sense of oneness. In my experience, it uh, it opens you up to. I'm going back to that web now. An idea, a way of communicating, a way of relating that is then a web to help all people with resonating experiences to yours. You come up with incontournable ways to kind of corral what they're tracking as the explanations for their experience of consciousness 
and you, you can plant a seed. And as long as you keep reflecting that seed, that person is going to either be forced to shed thoughts that don't resonate with them, explanations that don't resonate with them, games that don't resonate with them. Because those games that we formulate as a child to keep ourselves from feeling like the world is an extension of ourselves actually f fray us from letting the world in at the same time as we believe it's an extension of ourselves. So what happens if we start to, if we, if we don't, if we don't grow out from that state of, of heightened narcissism as a child, we don't grow out from it. We can't grow into the world and let enough of the world in that we're full of enough explanations and basic understandings of things to enliven the world around us. Like the clouds are evaporated water from the ocean. And there's this whole water cycle. Water gets heated. It turns into a vis invisible gas, goes into the sky, condenses around particles of dust, becomes floating amazing shapes in the sky, and then falls back down here. And that is just another day in what we are a part of. Just another thing that it does. We get to observe it and have feelings about it and try and understand it and have feelings about that and as long as we accept how we're able to explain that occurrence there tends to be wonder around it and if there's not wonder around it we tend to need to look deeper if there's not a relief around it we realize we're treating the symptoms and not the cause. And for this, I'd say, listen to my YouTube video about debunking uh, the phrase, you are what you eat. And that links back to um, my idea of, of our healthiest selves, our most intelligent selves. It's one that's in symbiosis with everything around us. And that we look to ourselves. Our own health is the indicator when our environment is symbiotically supporting us. Because when we're healthy, then our environment is healthy to support us. When we're not healthy, it means something in our environment or something in our ways of thinking is not ready to support us healthily. And so the fact that gratitude, compassion, Awareness, self-observance, generosity. These all lead to senses of, of fulfillment, of purpose. Altruism allows us to feel more and love more deeply. As opposed to the ego, which we can push to a far place and, 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 and get strong. But people who constantly find strength in ego and 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 find success in life tend to veer towards a sociopathic state and feel forced to contribute for the sake of accepting themselves rather than accepting themselves so much they want to contribute towards the acceptance of others So my message really is um, we're all to bask in our existential angst because that is the unfolding of ourselves. That is our story. That is the tension out of which we will unfold and manifest and we will create. In life, things come out of the contrast of things. Different specificity comes out of the contrast. Our ex existential angst is a contrast between us knowing we're fine and us having a bit of energy to agitate as if by a game against the idea that we're fine. And this is reflected in things like 
you can always speculate about someone else's life and compare it to yours. But really and truly, if you were in their head, living their life, you wouldn't be able to bring the comparison of your life to it. So you'd still be doing the same thing. And you can agitate against that. Or you can accept that by virtue of that, it must feel a lot more similar to be each other than it feels different. The only problem is we're butting our heads on the way to that realization. So guys, this is uh, Healer Holly. Spreading the love. I got a new haircut. I'm going to have a moment for this because that's my that's my vulnerability for this video. Got a new haircut. It's been uh, over a year because of lockdown situations in the UK. No, I just liked certain phases of it. There was there was chances to get haircuts, but I liked it, those phases. And then we locked down again. And then when, every time I got ready to cut my hair, things got locked down. And so I feel like after a year and three months of not having had a haircut, partly not by choice. I went to the barbers, I went to the hair salon and I forgot how to, I, I forgot how to, how to ask for the haircut that I wanted. Because that's how scared this stuff got me of change. So guys, this is why this is important right now as we come out of this pandemic. That we remember these kinds of things and that we hold each other through this lens through this sense of being, through this sense of communion.